Okay, we might just get this next session underway. Um, my name is Graham Hoare, I'm the ALRTA Vice President and I'm Works Shop and Safety Compliance and Induction Officer for the, the Martin Group of Companies. This forum session is all about effluent control. We will be exploring the problems the operators and the processes face in South East Queensland and, the, and looking, then looking at the issue from the national enforcement and government policy procedure perspective. First, I'd like to introduce the other members on my panel. David Dorton, Livestock Manager for Australia Country Choice. Bill Eaves, National Investigator, Coordinator of the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator. And Jeff Potter, Project Director of Productivity, Safety and NTC. Um, please make them feel welcome. <laughs> Livestock transport companies have been dealing with the as long as there has been trucks on the road. Wherever the animals, you have always got effluent. In most parts of Australia, it is a separate part of livestock transport, but however, there are certain hotspots where it's rapidly becoming a significant problem. For example, every week, here in South East Queensland, thousands of animals from all over Queensland and New South Wales converge on the four big processes located in the Brisbane urban fringe. When effluent is lost from vehicles, it's usually treated as a load restraint breach under the, under the heavy vehicle national law. Fines are ranged for upwards from $500. Livestock carries a highly contentious of this issue. Containing too much effluent in the, in the trailers lead to animal welfare problems. For example, when the effluent tanks are full, this dams up into the crate, and when the livestock having to stand in it, if the beast or the lamb goes down, they could drown them in their own effluent. Dumping effluent on the public roads can be a problem for biosecurity and some say road safety. At Martins we found that because livestock are sold by weight we cannot rely on producers to apply feed curfews prior to transport. All Martins trucks servicing the Brisbane area are fitted with effluent tank captured tanks. While the big, proce while the big processes have wash facilities available for trucks that have arrived and unloaded, they are managed to be dumping points for, for the, sorry, there is no, no managed dumping points for trucks in transit. Without reliable curfews in place, our tanks are often full well before we enter the Brisbane area and must either dump at unmanaged points or face possibility of roadside prosecution. So what can we do to resolve this problem? We believe that we need three things. A network of managed effluent dumping sites on key routes around effluent hotspots common sense enforcement that goes to the root of the problem and improve animal preparation practices. I have been actively speaking with local and state governments about ins the installation of managed in transit effluent dumping points in South East Queensland. While there is some support, there are many unknown related to ownership, management and costs and liabilities. There are some equipment builders in Australia interesting in the concept and in New Zealand, there's a fully operational effluent management strategy that includes in the transit dumping sites. The ALRTA will send a delegation to New Zealand in the early 2017 to inspect the system and collect information to support the development of detailed um, business case. In due course, the ALRTA and our state associations will be seeking support from the government and supply chain parties to build and manage in transit dumping facilities. In November 2016, the ALRTA formally asked the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator, the Direct Enforcement Office, to exercise responsibility to discretion with assessing whether or not the issue breached notices. We have Bill here today to talk about this enforcement. Animal Last year, the ALTA asked the, the Queensland Parliament Transportation Utilities Commission to clarify the application of the chain of responsibility law to personal prepare, persons prepare livestock for road transport. The committee agreed, and the, trans, the, the Queensland Transport Minister has asked the NTC to do this within the next 12 months. And Jeff Potter is here today to tell you about the clarification project. So I think that it is probably time to hear about an issue from a, a perspective, a, a processor perspective. Today I've got David Dorton here to talk to you, but I'm going to ask David a question. What is the risk to livestock process industry if we cannot find a workable solution to this problem? Thanks, Graham, and welcome everyone. The, uh, I think we all suffer from either being proactive or reactive 
And this issue has been around for as long as we've been carting cattle or livestock about. And unless we do something proactive, uh, when, when the incident happens, or the incidents happen, we will be forced into uh, doing something about it by reaction, by the authorities and so on. And a lot of those people are in the room today. So I congratulate all of you involved in the livestock transport industry on being proactive about taking it forward. We've seen what's happening with uh, braking and trailers and so on. I think the technology, the resources and the means to go forward to address this effluent problem, which is, will not go away and going forward will only get worse, um, is in all of our hands. And the responsibilities don't just lie with the processor, the producer or the transport company, <coughs> it lies with industry as a whole. And if we don't do something about it, it will come back to bite us. Thanks very much, David. Bill, we have had the chain of responsibility laws for about 20 years, but there has never been an effluent related prosecution or a livestock producer. Is it fair that transport companies are the only ones in, in the firing line? Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by saying it's both an honour and a privilege uh, to be here and I'm humbled by the opportunity to speak in front of you this afternoon. Um, I was going to present a PowerPoint, but I think this late in the afternoon I'll uh, spare you that. Um, I will, however, stick to a, a storyboard that I've prepared. Um, when I do a presentation like this, I like to start with a con concept of why there's a particular issue before I address what we could do and how we might go about addressing it. So, um, if you'll humble me, I'll start by addressing why there is a particular issue um, with effluent. Now, it starts with there being different statutory frameworks that make obligations seem unclear and uh, obligations seem uneven. The legislation doesn't necessarily describe uh, livestock preparation in terms of the heavy vehicle national law. Um, it's fair to say that parties in the supply chain take inconsistent approaches, particularly to livestock preparation, and there's no one-size-fits-all uh, treatment to the issue. Also, I think it's fair to say that, as a summary that collaboration or greater collaboration could be uh, improved upon. So let's talk about the statutory tension. We have the Heavy Vehicle National Law, we have the Animal Care and Protection legislation in various jurisdictions, we have workplace health and safety legislation in different jurisdictions, environmental protection laws, and indiscriminate road rules in different jurisdictions. And this is what leads to the uneven uh, playing field that I, I spoke about. So livestock preparation. The heavy vehicle national law holds operators scheduled as consignors, consignees, packers, loaders, load managers, and unloaders accountable. It doesn't specifically refer to livestock preparation. And a person in uh, charge of a vehicle, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, in, in charge of an animal or, or livestock in the hours preceding transport um, may heavily be in a position to influence the amount of effluent that will be deposited during transport. Now, depending on the circumstances, chain of responsibility may not necessarily extend to this person. Now, there are inconsistent approaches taken to effluent management. Um, by that I mean that there are truck washers available and disposable facilities, but sometimes they're not available. Uh, not all heavy vehicles are fitted with effluent tanks and tanks are not mandatory. And there are different approaches to livestock preparation. No one treatment on its own is enough. Uh, and these treatments need to work in unison. So effluent tanks on their own are necessary, but not enough. Disposal facilities help reduce the problem, but won't on their own uh, solve the problem. Wash facilities are only part of the solution. And livestock preparation is potentially an underutilised treatment for this particular issue. All treatments applied effectively um, will enhance the supply chain's ability to manage effluent. Collaboration, um, I make the point here that effluent is not somebody else's problem. Um, chain of responsibility attempts to address that, but potentially there's a cultural change that's needed 
so that parties, whether or not they're caught by the heavy vehicle national law or not, take uh, responsibility for effluent management. Communication and cooperation across the supply chain will reduce the amount of spillage. Who is responsible for what? In the current law, if a spillage occurs and there are steps a party could reasonably be expected to have taken to prevent the spillage, they could be held accountable. As I said earlier, um, the, the person in charge of a uh, livestock in the 48 hours preceding uh, preparation who is responsible for feeding and watering and taking general care of that particular animal isn't necessarily caught by the heavy vehicle national law depending on the circumstances. It's a matter of proximity and degree and the circumstances of that particular incident. In 2018, there will be an overarching and positive primary duty in all parties in the chain of responsibility to, so far as reasonably practicable, ensure that their conduct does not directly or indirectly cause a spillage. This has been restated in simple terms as a failure to take a particular measure which could have been taken to obviate an identifiable risk. So what's the solution? Part of the solution may be an industry code of practice which could inform enforcement agencies um, and courts and parties in the chain of responsibility of the standards that are reasonable and practicable for best practice in effluent management. Now, one of the issues to do with um, inconsistent uh, approaches to the law uh, in different jurisdictions comes down to a benchmark to apply in terms of what should have been done in the certain circumstances. This will result in a consistent approach to the law, a more greater consistency, and hold parties accountable. So how can we achieve this? A solution exists in working together to develop, encourage and promote productive, efficient, innovative and safe business practices for managing effluent across the entire livestock supply chain. A whole of industry supply chain approach, including all relevant stakeholders, also consulting um, internationally in terms of best practice, to develop industry standards will increase the prospects of achieving strategically placed disposal facilities, truck washes and effluent ponds, an increase in the use of effluent tanks, best practice in livestock preparation and a culture of voluntary compliance. The new focus for chain of responsibility compliance is, is a shift, not a uh, dramatic shift, but a shift nonetheless. And the focus shifts from on-road offences to off-road business practices looking for root cause analysis, identifying system failures, encouraging and promoting productive, efficient, innovative and safe business practices, and modifying future behaviours, encouraging a culture of voluntary compliance. Um, what I have done also is prepared something which I think is quite engaging, which sums up what I think are the issues with uh, effluent management and how we can come together to, to address that. So if you'll bear with me for 45 seconds longer that I have a short video. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much, Bill. My next speaker is Jeff um, from NTC. First question for you, Jeff, if you come up. The intent of the heavy vehicle, then H, sorry, the HVNL seems clear, but the states can't agree whether or not livestock preparation practices are actually captured by the chain of responsibility. How is the NTC going to fix this situation? Thanks very much, Graham. The easy questions first. Uh, uh, look, firstly, uh, thanks very much for the uh, the invitation to um, uh, come up and uh, and speak to you today. Really, uh, you know, appreciate the chance to explain 
what we have done and what we're planning to do to contribute to the uh, solution to, uh, to this problem. Because I think as, as everybody uh, uh, recognises, one reason that makes it such a uh, complex and uh, difficult issue to resolve is that there are so many parties that need to work together and uh, uh, touch on issues around road safety, biosecurity, animal welfare, sale prices, meat quality, enforcement standards and the, and the like. Um, just for those of you who may not be familiar with the National Transport Commission, um, we exist because the Australian Constitution doesn't give the federal government any responsibility to make laws about road transport other than the vehicle standards such as Stephen spoke to you uh, about before, uh, uh, before morning tea. So in order for all of the state governments to pass state laws about road transport that are consistent and don't have radical changes as you cross uh, the border from one state to another, which is fairly significant in industries uh, such, as, uh, such as yours, and make sure that what's mandatory in Queensland isn't illegal in New South Wales and vice versa. Um, the NTC exists to develop those reforms, get agreement from all the jurisdictions, uh, so that then the states and territories can pass their own legislation that uh, reflects an agreed position that will apply nationally. Um, and as uh, Bill mentioned, um, we have uh, recently uh, put forward recommendations to ministers about changes to the chain of responsibility um, that uh, have then been put through the, uh, the Queensland uh, Parliament with all of the agreed changes and that will then be picked up by all the other state, uh, state and territory parliaments other than the Northern Territory and Western Australia um, who uh, aren't part of the process yet. Um, in um, putting together those chain of responsibility um, provisions that um, uh, the bill went through, uh, in the preparation of those, Alata made the um, uh, a proposal that uh, we amended the current definition of packer in the chain of responsibility um, to include specifically provisions of uh, preparing animals for transport as part of the, uh, uh, the legislative requirements to make it very clear that um, persons who perform that role are part of the chain of responsibility. Um, we didn't do that. We couldn't get agreement from everyone who was required to agree for that to happen. What we did instead was um, improve the uh, wording of the load restraint outcomes so that it is now, when that legislation comes into force, going to be an, uh, having a provision that makes it an offence for a person to c permit someone else to drive a vehicle uh, on a road if that vehicle doesn't comply with the loading requirements uh, that are applied. That's in addition to the current load restraint um, provisions. That will apply to everyone in the chain of responsibility. It will also apply to every person who's not in the chain of responsibility but is in a position to uh, permit someone to use a, a vehicle. And because the wording of the, uh, the legislation uses the term a person, that also includes a company. Um, that permits someone to drive on the road without properly taking the load restraint into consideration. So that provision will be, will be part of the, uh, um, the, the new requirements uh, that, are, that are coming into force, which should make it clearer that it's not just the driver who is uh, responsible for the um, restraint of load onto the, onto the vehicle. Um, However, noting um, the concerns that uh, Alata had in the preparation of that legislation, uh, as well as um, some requests that came from the uh, Queensland Parliamentary Committee that reviewed the legislation and subsequently uh, uh, the, uh, the then Queensland uh, Minister who requested NTC to take further action to make sure that everyone involved in the uh, process is quite clear about what their obligations are and what they're meant to do. Um, we are. Uh, including in the revisions to the Load Restraint Guide, which is a project we currently have underway, uh, some specific uh, changes to make clear to everyone involved what is expected of them, what is involved in properly preparing uh, livestock for loading um, to comply with the Load Restraint uh, uh, Guideline requirements. Um, that, and that will include clear guidance on the responsibilities, on what's required to prepare livestock for transport and consider things such as animal welfare, overfeeding, overwatering, uh, and the uh, and the like. Um, the 
technical reviews on the load restraint guide are still underway. Uh, we expect to be able to go out for public comment uh, around the middle of, uh, of this year on the, uh, the, the wording uh, of the text in the load restraint guide and we've committed to come back to ministers uh, before the end of the year with the final version for them to uh, sign off and approve. I should say though that having the offence in the legislation, having the guidelines on what you need to do to comply with the requirements the legislation sets out still isn't enough to solve the problem. Um, the, the points that Bill made about the value of industry codes, of getting everyone involved to agree how to manage it best, including, and as is certainly happening in some jurisdictions, uh, the provision of suitable facilities for draining uh, effluent tanks and washdown of, uh, of vehicles that are able to, to cope with it are also important. Um, so uh, this is the, the, the first step to, uh, to getting the problem solved, but there's, uh, as I'm sure you all recognise, still a bit of a way to go. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff. We've got just one more quick speaker, Craig Price. We've got a mic over to Craig. Um, Craig's from um, Kilcoy Pastoral Company. He's a livestock manager. He's just going to have a quick talk to what um, Kilcoy abattoirs have done with effluent over there. Thanks, Graham. Um, just to give everyone a bit of a, a quick brief background about our situation is. Um, at Kilcoy, where we're situated, for those who don't know, we're, we're situated probably an hour and a half from Brisbane and about an hour west of the Sunshine Coast. Um, it's a quiet little country town um, and, and we've been there now, the, the, the abattoirs, for, for a bit over 50 years. Um, as, as that sort of city urbanisation starts to sort of creep towards Kilcoy, we're sort of finding, you know, it's never hasn't always been an issue with, with the effluent, but we're finding more and more so, particularly in probably the last 10 years where it, where it has started to become that. So we, we, we went along a bit of a journey sort of a couple of years ago where I've, I've been fighting the journey for our, our company to, to try and get a facility whereby we can address this issue of effluent on the road, particularly in Kilcoy, because all our trucks particularly come from the west and they're all travelling through the main street of town, which in itself causes some problems. So what we've, we've done is we've actually built a, um, a, 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 a disposal unit at our ramp. So what happens as trucks come in and unload the cattle, it's all there, all done. So just the truck drivers all have to do is un, undo their, their, their tanks while they're unloading the, the cattle. The, F, the, the tanks get emptied um, and away it goes. And then when they finish, they just tidy it back up to put their, their knobs back on and away they go. So that, that's, that's addressed our problem. So it's, it's been good. We've even got acknowledgement from our local council. I, I was speaking to one of our councillors just before Christmas. He made a point of coming and seeing me and said, look, what you fellas have done is absolutely terrific. It's cleaned up that main street. It's been great. So we've, we've got the acknowledgement from them that it's working. Unfortunately, though, every now and then we have the issue whereby the trucks coming into town have got full tanks and they're still spilling effluent on the main street. So what I've sort of, you know, my battle at the moment is we're saying, well, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can as far as getting rid of the effluent once it gets to the plant, but it's what happens to it before it gets to us where the problem is. So, you know, I've, I've been sort of, you know, mentioning to a, to a few people that, you know, what we really need to try and do is do a similar system with what what they've got in New Zealand, where they have those right roadside effluent disposal tanks, you know, strategically located around the country. You know, there hasn't got to be a lot of them, just, just a hatful whereby, you know, those tanks, once they get full, they've at least got the option to be able to empty them somewhere. Um, I know of trucking companies that, that, that well, one in particular that, that bought some new trailers a few years ago, they had, had tanks installed on the trailers but have since had the tanks taken off because they said they were more trouble than they were worth. Now, that to me, we, 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 we're starting to go forward, but all of a sudden we're starting to go backwards again. So that's, that's not good for the industry and it's not good for, for the communities that we live in. So I think, you know, we all need to sort of address it. Yeah, definitely sort of looking at the, the loading of the cattle, but, you know, in our, in our instance whereby, you know, we, we only process all grain-fed cattle, um, a lot of those cattle are, are coming from a rel relatively short distance. 
um, and they're coming out of feedlots. So we tend to find that the, the effluent is a lot looser, sloppier, you know, it's not coming off hard feed where it's a lot harder. So we tend to sort of probably see it at the worser, worser stage than, than, than others. So, um, yeah, that, that's just our, our situation. Um, it, the other thing is, is the challenge with, with getting these roadside dumping stations is, and as I, I fought my company for two years to get what we've got in place now, for one reason, it wasn't the cost of it, cost was nothing, it was, but the question they kept on saying to me was, okay, we'll put it in, what are we going to do with the effluent now? And I think that's going to be probably the challenge where, you know, whether it be main roads, mm. council, government, whoever it is that we need to, to work with to get these, these dumping stations, it's going to be an issue where they'll be asking the question, well, okay, what do we actually do with the effluent once we've got it? So that's, that's the, the battle that we've got. So um, with us, we're lucky enough that, that ours just go into our effluent ponds, which isn't ideal, but it's still, you know, we've got somewhere for it to go. Okay, thanks very much, Craig. I'd like to congratulate um, Kilcoy Pastoral Company for bringing that and make our job a bit easier. Um, David Dorton from Australian <laughs> Country Choice has got a little short presentation. Thanks, Graham. Thanks, Craig. Can I just concur that? Uh, yeah, you're fortunate to live in uh, a little sleepy country town called Kilcoy. We're right in the middle of Brisbane. Uh, so we have 18 to 21 B doubles a day coming in. Uh, so we're, we have exactly the same challenges as you. We provide a dump facility and also a truck wash. But um, I grew up on a dairy farm in the Hutter Valley in New South Wales. So anyone who's had anything to do with a dairy farm has had a fair bit to do with the effluent. And really, uh, it's a shitty subject, OK? Um, the, uh, I thought growing up and having uh, left the dairy farm, I was going to get away from it. It's all come back to bite me. So the, uh, there's a shot of Craig when he was a young fella. The, uh, it's amazing what, uh, what you can do with effluent. You know, growing up, I used to keep my feet warm. I used to uh, have to shovel it, hose it, push it, distribute it, spread it. So yeah, me and effluent, pretty good friends. The, um, how many livestock transporters in the room? Hands? Well, you're the best looking roosters I've seen today. The, um, when people cart cattle, whoever they are, some go first class, okay? Some go, some go business class. And then there's the, uh, the ones that are always stuck down in uh, economy. So depending on how good your, your transport unit is, how flash it is, whether it's got tanks on it or not, well, not an economy, the, um, they have to get there somehow, okay? So whether they come by hot air balloon, by truck, by trailer, by plane or otherwise, they have to get to the plant somehow. And therefore, that's yours, ours, Craig's responsibility to be able to get them there in the most proficient, an animal welfare compliant condition that we can. The side effects um, are pretty dreadful. So this is what we all have to avoid. Not you, not me, not Craig, all of us, okay? And it's all a shared responsibility. It doesn't lie just with the producer, just with the processor, just with the trucking company not with the industry authority. We have to be able to prevent and make a means to be able to control this. This issue isn't going to go away. It is with us to stay. And as I said earlier, when Graham asked me, it will only get more difficult and more prevalent. And from an animal welfare, biosecurity, road safety, uh, odour uh, point of view, it'll be front and centre. We provide facilities for people with RVs and camper vans to be able to dump theirs. And as highlighted in New Zealand, they can do it over there. So I don't believe there's any reason why not we can do it here. But both state-wise and 
federally wise, we all have to be a part of the big picture. The, um, I hadn't been at ACT very long, and I'd be, I've been there 17 years now, and I had the local uh, like Murray Progress Association, which is like a PNF Parents and Friends Council, uh, come and confront me at work, and I had to address this, uh, these parents and um, as to why there was shit on the windscreen of the local school bus. And uh, they said that, you know, what sort of an example is this setting to our overseas visitors? As I said, we're not far from the airport. You know, why don't cattle arrive in self-contained containers? And I have had to explain about animal welfare and, you know, ventilation and, you know, what's, uh, what's required. And they said, oh, well, you know, OK, well, that's understandable. But I said, look, any animal that shits on your bus, I will kill it. I said, oh, well, that's a bit, uh, <laughs> that's a bit dramatic. <laughs> I said, well, uh, you know, nothing's too good for you lot. <laughs> but um, that's a true story. So when you've had to address the local you know, community and Craig's in the same boat, you know, that's, a, that's a fact. You know? So we've had to make them aware. And yeah, thanks to the, uh, the advances, we've been able to fix a lot of those issues. The, um, there's some upside, I believe, in that uh, what you can do with effluent. This bus, it's powered by effluent, the biomethane. It just broke the land speed record for a bus in the UK. It hit 126.7 kilometres an hour. Right? You get booked for speeding. And, uh, you know, maybe as a byproduct, we can, use, we can put BP out of business and uh, be running our own. So how far away from that to make it efficient? Well, we don't know. But anything's possible with technology. But um, I, I believe that, uh, yeah, we've got digesters at many of the processing plants. We've been able to use the biomethane to run generators, making electricity, powering buses and cars. So maybe this is a spin-off advantage as an alternative fuel source. You know, I'm just putting it out there. But uh, anyway, that's, that's all I've got time for. I'll look forward to some questions. Um, but the reason I don't buy my wife a convertible car is I'm too afraid to. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Thanks very much, David. So it's your turn. Anyone out there would like to ask our panel um, some questions? Matthew from ALRTA. I just wanted to ask a question to Jeff. Um, uh, we're aware that uh, Minister Hinchcliffe has written to the NTC to, uh, to ask that the NTC clarify the application of chain of responsibility law to uh, livestock preparation within the next 12 months. I, I didn't yep. hear anything about a specific project in that space in your, your presentation. I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit about um, what, what you're doing there? Well, what's two, proposed? Two specific things that, that we're doing there. One is through the Load Restraint Guide. Um, in terms of putting the provision that there's an offence there and the Act is all well and good, but unless you put out the information to say <laughs> what you need to do in order to not commit that offence, it's, uh, it's a bit hard on those concerns. So that's the, 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 the one arm of it. Uh, and the other is that um, we have taken a project on to the road rules maintenance, uh, road rules, uh, the heavy vehicle national law maintenance um, project to look at whether there is a way of more clearly expressing perhaps by use of examples, the, uh, the, the requirements that are, that are already there. Um, but as, as with anything we do, that's uh, subject to uh, getting uh, all of the jurisdictions to agree that, um, no, that uh, it needs to, needs to go in. Hello, it's aware of that first part, not, not so much the second part, so we'd, yeah. we'd really love to work with you to, um, you know, to help clarify that and anything Absolutely. we can do, um, we'd, we'd be there for you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. OK, anyone else? Okay, we got one. Tasmania. Hi. Um, yeah, one thing that concerns me is that the vendor declaration forms with the hours of food and water uh, turn up there any time of the day or night. Who can honestly put down? What vendor can, and it's a stat deck, I believe, how if they say eight hours off food and water, we don't know what time we're going to get there, how is 
that's not implementing it correctly. I mean, it's signed by both parties. I mean, we should have to designate time of dispatch and then if anyone wants to calculate how long they've been off food and water, well, it's a separate issue, isn't it? Okay, what do you think? Yeah, look, I'll talk to that. The, um, the what we do, and um, as a standalone, we give people an arrival time, okay? So, and we try and give our cattle that are travelling the further, furthest distance the greatest spell before we process them. The cattle that come the shortest distance will give the, a, a shorter spell. But I think all the, the livestock transporters in the room know that there's nothing like putting an animal on a tractor to get the, uh, the manure shaken out of them. And the majority of what they're going to lose will be in the first 100 k's and then gradually, gradually decrease as the kilometres roll on. So it's 5 or 6% for the first 100 and then you know, 1% for every 100 after that is a rough rule of thumb. The curfewing beforehand will vary from place to place, ration to ration, grass fed, grain fed, uh, dry roll ration, um, steam flake and otherwise. But uh, producers or cockies or whatever you like to call them will, being in the nature of what they are, will try and fatten them onto the track. So they'll, you know, whereas I believe feedlotters are part of the, of the solution, not part of the problem. So, you know, cattle coming off oats, you know, very wet, very green, not locked up, are the ones that are going to cause some big issues. But the, you will find most of that effluent along the sides of the highway before they get to the major centres. But whereas your feedlots coming a set distance every day, day after day, we have a summer and a winter time curfew regime. You saw the conditions last weekend. They're not going to lock cattle off feed or water in those sort of conditions. But the, uh, their consumptions are down anyway. So we can monitor that um, effluent control or effluent management and, and curfew on a feedlot basis. And as part of our ongoing research and R&D is prepare a better strategy prior to dispatch on those cattle to arriving at their destinations. But coming back to the NVD, yes, it's a national declaration uh, to enforce it from a who said, you know, she said, he said, and time off feed and water is a very difficult one, and I don't have the answer. Okay. Thanks, David. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Um, Brian uh, I've got a mic there behind you, Brian. Brian Smith from Smith Brothers. I come from northern part of Australia, and if you bring in this legislation over effluent, how's that going to affect our transport in the regard that we use predominantly open crates because sometimes 50% more of our transport operation is on dirt roads. Um, what sort of concessions are they going to make in the legislation to allow us to still operate the way we do? Okay. You want that one? No. In terms, in terms of the, the, the changes we currently have going through or have gone through the um, Queensland Parliament, um, the changes for the drivers haven't changed at all, they're what they are at the moment. Um, you haven't changed anything as, as of yet? No. In my experience with over the years, whatever happens in the South East corner, we cop it anyway. So, on, you know, and like in all real terms, the problem we down here is only because of the population that you have and the number of processes. We only have one processor. processor services as far west as the border and over the border and as far north as we are. Um, so the diversity we have up there in mileage and distance is far greater than what you've got down here. Like your problem is only in a, in a 600, 700 kilometre radius of, of an area in the south southeast corner. Are we going to be penalised up there with our crates? Because like I say, most of our crates are open we're going to be penalised and have to um, change our gear to allow because we live in different conditions than what these folks operate down here. Is that going to come in? Not any proposals to change uh, change the gear required on the trucks. 
And does that affect us if we happen to stock cattle down here for some reason? You know, it's in the minority jobs, you know, like doing odd jobs for them. Are we going to be affected? Graham, I can probably speak to that a little bit in that we, we have a lot of uh, movements from the north right down through to here. But due to geography and truck configurations, you can't get a triple into uh, past Roma or past Morvan and such. So you're normally cross-loading onto a B-double configuration or an AB triple or something to go to a feedlot rather than going to a pro processor. So, but in the event that you are going to a processor, you can't get down the range here anyway. And yeah, any animal that's still got anything left up in it after coming the distance you're coming, I don't think it's going to be an issue. It'll, it'll depend on, as I said, whether anything left in those animals and whether you, you create a problem. You wouldn't be allowed into our site with a crate with a crate like that. Yep. Okay. Most of the, some of the abattoirs is in Brisbane. You do need tanks. One is Cannon Hill, and the other is Kil, um, Kilpatrick. So you're uh, sorry, Kilcoy. So you are really in trouble already. So that's something we may have to look at as our Queensland Association as how we deal with that issue. We've got northern Queensland and the, the south east, that's two different. We've got the population down there. You guys haven't got the population. So I think moving forward, I think that's where we've got to look at how we, how we go about it. Okay. Is there anyone else? Yeah, Graham. Uh, one for Craig Price. Uh, Craig, you said uh, at your dump site it goes into your effluent, no, effluent ponds. Uh, what do you do when you uh, clean out your effluent ponds? Where does that go to from there? Yeah, basically we've got a series of effluent ponds that all end up sort of, yeah, it all gets irrigated on the country. So, yeah, it's all just part of the aerobic and anaerobic systems where it just goes from dam to dam um, and then it's just irrigated onto, onto grass. Mm -hmm. Righto. Anyone else? Lindley? Last one, Lindley. Thank you. Uh, Lindley Miners, President of LBRCA New South Wales. Um, also on the Animal Welfare Committee for the National Body. Uh, I was outside on the telephone there earlier. I guess Graham mentioned there's a delegation going to New Zealand shortly to have a look what's over there. Um, certainly, what Brian said out of North Queensland is right. One, one size doesn't fit all. What goes on in Western New South Wales or the Territory or uh, West, uh, Western Queensland doesn't suit what goes on in my backyard, the Snowy Mountains or here in South East Queensland. I can have as much come out the front corner of the crate as the back corner. So coming downhill, out of the mountains, it's uh, the legislation is where the problem is. We've got to change the legislation. We've been harping on about it for a long time. The load restraint guide says we can't allow anything to fall from your vehicle. So we better take the wash, washer wipers off every motor car because that's effectively what it is. We, uh, we need to put it in another bucket because I've never seen anyone actually get really killed by getting hit in the head with a lump of shit. <laughs> Excuse the pun. <laughs> it's not a brick, it's not a lump of steel. And I beg the NTC, NHVR, and where, where we're at, we've got, we're, trying, we, we're doing the best we can to fix the problem tanks, preparation, talk to your best customers, what Craig and Kilcoy have done. I, oh, it's the first I've heard of that. I reckon that's a great system. But the road authorities are actually not going with us and that's why we've got to see what goes on in New Zealand. So to, to see how, well, how we're going to uh, set that up. But it can't be everywhere. But the biggest problem is it doesn't matter how you build that crate, you cannot... 100% keep every bit in there. So when they rewrite this uh, NTC with the uh, load restraint legislation, there's got to be some sort of provision here because at the end of the day we've got animal welfare, we've got heat and we've got cold. The mountains is cold. What you do in the winter time for preparation and exactly what uh, David said earlier, what we do in winter time for Preparation is not what we do in summertime, 
and it, and it doesn't matter which wind you're in, whether you're in my area or Western New South Wales, it's a different thing. So all those things have got to be uh, taken on board and worked through to get a result. But putting it on paper to say you cannot do this, it's just not, okay. it can't work. It's got to be better. Okay, thanks, Lindley. Um, Bill from the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator just wants to say one more comment. <laughs> yeah, look, I think it's important to point out the distinction between um, some of the road rules that are applied in various jurisdictions by police and road authorities in terms of they can be, in, in essence, a strict liability offence, which there are no uh, exculpations. Um, some legislation is written in a way that says without reasonable excuse. Now, before coming here, I had a look at some of those provisions and you'll find that they are strict in the sense that if you spill something onto a road, you're liable potentially to an infringement. So from the regulator's perspective, there is a distinction between um, the heavy vehicle national law and being responsible for that and the state road rules. Um, because the heavy vehicle national law does have a exculpation in the sense that if you can demonstrate that you've taken all reasonable steps and in the, um, in the future law it, that will change, um, it's very unlikely that um, you would be, uh, or improbable that you would uh, be subject to enforcement or prosecution. And there is a slight <coughs> distinction, so to add a further layer of complexity, um, in, in effect, um, the, the distinction between whether the issue is actually the application of the heavy vehicle law or a state uh, road rule is an important distinction. Okay. And, and if I just um, respond to, to the point that, that Lindley made, there is absolutely no point making legislation that requires people to do the impossible. They can't do it. So the, the change I refer to, I didn't mention the full wording because the last um, seven words, unless the person has a reasonable excuse, um, are there. So it's not an absolute uh, offence. Some, some things are just impractical to comply. And that is something we are very conscious of in revising the load restraint guide. Um, and as Bill referred to before, the, uh, uh, the, the prospect of developing a, um, a, an industry code for the matter that can demonstrate what a reasonable uh, attempt to uh, load looks like, and it doesn't have to mean perfection. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Possible. And in this, as in logbooks, as in speed compliance, as with the roadworthy, there is nothing that is going to stop someone who's had a very bad day um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. behaving unreasonably. Yeah. Okay. I think we've run out of time. I'd like to get everyone to thank Jeff, David, Bill, and Craig um, for being a part of this session. <laughs> All right, I'd like to call on Mark Collins of the Emerging Technology Panel members to come to the stage, please. <laughs>